three, two, one. We are live. Coming at you from, well, actually, we're coming at you from two different places. I'm coming at you from <laughs> North Edinburgh, Massachusetts. <laughs> Joined by Coach Sharon today. We're going to be talking about the uh, seven common myths, seven common beliefs that sabotage sustainable fitness, more specifically. I had to write it down. Coach Sharon, how are you feeling today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm living the dream. If I was any better, I would say the deck was stacked. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's get into it. All right. So let's uh, let's talk about this. Um, what, what, first of all, what's the motivation for wanting to talk about this today? These seven common beliefs that sabotage sustainable results, fitness, all that. I received, uh, you know, looking back over the last, well, years really, but I, I, I spent a lot of time dispelling myths mm -hmm. with my clients, new and uh, I'll say more tenured clients, not just the ones that I've been working with for like two or three or four months, but ones that I've been working with for a long time who for some reason have somehow avoided my little soapbox rantings about some of the things that I hear about um, from influencers or, or in a magazine or online. I mean, literally, it, it's not just an influencer. Some of the mainstream media outlets, for whatever reason, share information. I'm just going to say share information that is not 100% accurate. And those of us in this industry, I'm sure we all cringe. Hopefully, we all cringe like we're aware that it's not true. So anyway, I spent a lot of time dispelling these myths. And I thought, you know, if I could help more people quicker it would help them and i don't have to keep repeating what i'm saying like three times a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's really all about me it has nothing yeah to do right <laughs> this is you know. this is me being able to solve this that's funny yeah just it's all about time efficiency for me <laughs> that's funny yeah i mean i i see too like i we were talking about before this like you had said like people can spend so much time just like they're wasting time spinning uh, their wheels they're wasting money on things that they probably don't need to be spending money on like you know ketones and stuff like that or whatever it is so i'm excited to dive into this with you what what do you got what's uh i know we got all right. of these but we'll just do seven yeah today. yeah we're just doing seven today there will likely be at least one or two more podcasts on this so i just chose seven randomly these are not like the top seven i'm not saying that next week or in two weeks yeah. They're not better or worse, right? These are just seven. <laughs> You'll chosen. just have to stay tuned and find out. <laughs> I know there's a list like this long, if you can see this in, in the in the uh, in the podcast. So, anyways, so the first one is, uh, and I have them written over here. So if you see me looking back and forth, that's why. I'll put um, them in the chat too. Yeah, if you eat after seven p.m., you will gain weight. Mm -hmm. That is a bunch of, and this is my scientific term, malarkey. <laughs> um, you can eat after 7 p.m. and not gain weight. Energy balance is what determines your body weight. So in the simplest of terms, it's calories in versus calories out. So if for some reason you wanted to eat all, let's say that you work during the day and you sleep overnight. If for some reason you wanted to eat all of your calories at 11 and finish at 11.59 p.m., like you're eating between 11.45 and 11.59 p.m. The next day, are you going to gain weight? Well, if you weigh yourself at 6 in the morning, perhaps, because you probably went right to bed after that, although you likely felt some discomfort, maybe didn't sleep very well. But even if you did sleep very well, first thing in the morning, yeah, you may weigh a little bit more just because your body hasn't processed it all. But if you eat like that consistently, and you weigh yourself at the same time consistently, your weight is not going to go up. As long as your caloric output, the exercise, the activity that you participate in throughout the day stays the same. Now, from a, and I started to allude to this, from a um, discomfort level, you may find that your body, like you don't respond well if you eat all that food right before you lay down and go to bed. But purely from a gain weight standpoint, you're not going to gain weight. Yes. Yeah. I think this is a, I mean, this is such a per, pervasive myth, I guess we could say, you know, goes right in the same, like can't eat carbs after 7 PM. 
<clears throat> I feel like this goes right in line with the before people break through they're kind of still stuck with going all in and all out and they're very zoomed in to like the day but the fact to the matter is like you said it's energy balance and it's not even energy balance in the day specifically that really matters it's the energy balance over days a week really a month if you really want to zoom out it's over a year now of course like if you're only measuring your progress once a year man maybe that, that you won't have enough opportunity to adapt and change but yeah it's uh just zooming out like there there are no there there's nothing magic in the air that that comes after 7 p.m or 8 p.m or whatever it is that yeah makes the food turn to fat or if you have inactivity for eight hours to 10 hours to 12 hours afterwards it doesn't matter um and this is very freeing, I will say, because I remember the first time I heard this, and I was like, that can't be right. But once I you know, dug into the research, the science, and started believing it and adopting it, oh my God, not just for myself, but for my clients too, how freeing. And this is going back like 15 years ago, but it's so freeing. Yeah, I, I, th I read somewhere, now I don't know what I said for you. <laughs> is true. What I'm about to say, I cannot verify this somewhere that the whole idea of not eating after a certain time or not eating carbs after 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whatever, whoever said, right? I read that, um, I don't know if it was a doctor, I think it was a doctor started telling his clients that just to get them to stop eating, because a lot of people say, when I get home from work, I eat, right? I'm bored. I eat. I'm sitting in the house. I'm watching TV. I eat. And so I, I read that's that's how it started. Do it's I know if that's true? No. Could I see it being true? Yeah. Yeah. What wherever it came from, it's like it's not science. It's just right. someone trying to change behavior. someone else's behavior. Yeah. Right. And if that's what works for you, especially in the beginning when this is all new then do it yes if but if your schedule gets you home at 6 30 p.m right don't feel compelled to stuff your face and the rest of the food you're supposed to be eating the rest of the day in like 30 minutes like you don't have Just to do there. that yeah one of my one of my biggest meals for a long time, it was my biggest meal, but one of my biggest meals is normally my last meal of the day. And it's well after 7 PM. Mm -hmm. and that's what works for me. Does that mean it works for Coach Ryan? No. Does it work for you? No, I don't know, mm -hmm. but that's what works for me. So part of making your, whether it's weight loss or building muscle, uh, a lot of clients that we work with are trying to lose weight, at least them initially, then they, they're like, oh, this is great. Look how I look. Now I want to build muscle. Yeah. Um, but whatever your goals are, you need to find, for you to be sustainable, you need to find what works for you. So I make a lot of suggestions when I work with clients and then I preface it or follow it up rather with figure out what works for you. Yeah. Just because I say it can work, if it's not sustainable to you, don't do it. So if that means that stopping for now, not eating after 7 p.m. works for you and you're not hungry or cranky and you still sleep well and you're performing well and your synapses are firing, mm. then great. But if it's if that's not working for you, then you need to make some changes because yes. it needs to be sustainable. Yeah, and there, there is no, as you said, like no one size fits all. It's, you know, to be, to be truly sustainable, it's got to be personalized. And going back to what you said about changing behavior, I feel like that's why intermittent fasting worked well or works well for a lot of people or can work well. It's not magic mechanically. Like they're really, people can talk about like, yeah, your ghrelin's going to be a little bit lower and some of these hunger hormones are going to be different. And it's like, you know, your leptin's going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, affected. But really what's happening is behavior is changing, you know, and, People in the beginning of, I'll say, a true transformation thrive in black and white. They just want to know, like, hey, tell me what to do. And that's a fine, that's fine to start. But the problem with keeping that is it doesn't prepare you for every season of life. I've said this before, I, I believe, uh, actually on a podcast with Coach Sharon specifically, 
um, I think even said it yesterday with Coach Andrew, <laughs> uh, the, the program or what you are currently doing today to make progress in your fitness journey and your body transformation journey would be different than what, you're, what you'd be doing six months in the past or even six months in the future if you were starting at either of those times. And the reason is because there's different circumstances happening to you, right? The weather is different. You know, uh, one of the reasons that we focus on 12-month programs with a lot of our clients, even if it's not going to take you 12 weeks to get to your goal, is for the simple fact that we want you to be able to sustain through every season in circumstance of stress that can come. And you might be able to get in shape and stay in shape, spring, summer, fall, but man, you live in the Northeast and that winter comes and now you can't walk outside and your mental space isn't feeling that good and now you feel like garbage and it all goes away. But if we didn't prepare for that, well, that's us dropping the ball on you, you know, which is not what we want to. That's my little ramble. <laughs> no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I have a client right now, Jamie, she's lost yeah. 31 pounds in about 11 weeks. And she, she reached her goal. Oh, well, now I'm sorry, 35 pounds in 11 weeks. She just reached her goal earlier this week. Crushing it. And she sent me a note. She said, hey, I want to, because we, we talked about this. She said, hey, I, I, I want to try to lose another five pounds to see how I look and see how I feel. But after that, then I want to go into a muscle building phase. Heck yeah. And she is, she understands that this is a, the 12 month program is ideal because she knows that losing weight doesn't mean you're going to keep it off or trying to build muscle doesn't mean you're going to be able to put it on and, and keep it on mm -hmm. and putting it together um, week after week or month after month. That's really good. And you should set, celebrate your successes, but it's stringing together month after month, after month, after month over an entire year where you face the obstacles and, and obstacles could be good things too, you know, mm -hmm. anniversaries, weddings, in yeah. addition to bad things, you know, like you've lost your job or something like that. It's how you respond to that initially and what you do in the weeks following it. And that's why this is a lifestyle. And a lot of people who come to our program, um, when they leave, they're, they're so like genuinely happy that they've made a lifestyle change. They feel it. They yeah. they say this feels different than it has in the past because I I think of things differently and I view things differently. It's so powerful. Anyway, we are off the mess. So yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, I mean we'll get back in a second. <clears throat> we'll get back in a second. I I think there's a I think Jamie's such a good example too. Like usually when we think about body transformation, if you want to lose weight, that's kind of feels like the whole journey. Like, okay, I got to lose 40 pounds yeah. and that's the end state. But really, that's only phase one. You know, you had said fat loss phase, muscle building phase. Wait, there's more? And, you know, a lot of times <clears throat> people can build a little bit of muscle as they're, you know, starting their journey if they're unconditioned. But really, if you're going to have any noticeable muscle building uh, and really change your physique to be lean and mean, if you will... Uh, that has to be independent from fat loss. It has to be at two different times. Because we're, when we're talking about energy balance, when we're, when we're in a caloric deficit, it's very hard to build muscle, near impossible if you have any base of muscle on you. You know, but you burn fat. Consequently, that means that if you want to build muscle, you actually have to be in a slight caloric surplus. Yeah. You know, that sounds crazy for a lot of people. Wait a second. But surplus meat, that's how I got fat in the first place. That's how I added fat. I can't be in a surplus. Don't do it. But there's a right way and a wrong way, right? It's like if you're in a caloric surplus of 500, let's say, or 1,000 a day per week, maybe only 100 of those calories are going towards muscle building. Well, now the other 900 are just being stored as fat. Yeah, don't play that game. You need a slight caloric surplus. And I will tell you what. For, you can probably attest to this as well, Coach Sharon, but for me especially and all the clients that I've worked with, the most fun phases are muscle building. Oh, Fat yeah. loss, eh, you know, it's it's a necessary part of the game, but you feel like a like you feel so good when you're in that slight caloric surplus. Oh my yeah. lord. And like you love exercise, like me. 
exercising a caloric surplus, or I'm sorry, caloric deficit, I hate it. <laughs> you know, I'm not a big fan. Um, it's hard. Hard, really hard, right? Can you make it sustainable? Yes. Can you make it enjoyable? More enjoyable? Yes. But working out in a caloric surplus oh, it makes everything better. Living in a caloric surplus, making everything okay. better, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, fun stuff. What's myth number two? <laughs> All right. So, well, myth number two is the carbs after seven. But myth number three is um, a lot of people think crunches are going to give you washboard abs. Okay. There is, there are many studies, I'm into research studies, like uh, verifiable research studies, not company-sponsored research studies on their own products, right? So these are third-party studies, but a lot of studies were performed and um, they, they showed that if you are, if you, anyone, if you are looking at performing, if you are believing that crunches are going to give you fat loss, you are going to have to perform over 22,000 crunches to lose a pound of fat. Like seriously, right. crunches don't it's make you lose fat. Now, very. So crunches, they can, it, when performed properly, I've seen many, many, many people perform them improperly. So let's assume that you're performing them properly. You can build your abdominal muscles, but until, you're, until you get rid of the fat that's covering them, you're not going to see them. So the idea is in a structured program like ours, you're going to be at a caloric deficit. If you're trying to lose weight, you're going to be at a caloric deficit in a smart way, not in a foolish haphazard way, yeah. in a smart way while you are performing exercises, which could include crunches to help develop your muscles. So when you shed the fat, Hey, look, there's a muscle tone, right? But you can't spot reduce fat. So you can't say, well, I don't want to lose fat in my stomach. That's just not how it works. Fat loss is um, kind of like data, garbage in, garbage out. Mm. So the first fat that you, the first place on your body that you gain weight will be the last place that you lose it. The last place you put it on will be the first place you lose it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. But yeah, both correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's myth number, I think we're up to four. Uh, three. I think that was three. Oh, Crunches three. will give you washboard abs. Yeah, I find yes. you do. I, I know for me, like, I always, the th I, I, I'm very similar in, like, compartmentalizing thinking. And I've always thought of, like, for every action we do in fitness, there's really three outcomes and it goes into one of the buckets. Now they can go into either of the bucket. They can like, you know, uh, coexist, but the first bucket is, uh, uh, which is usually what people care the most about physique, which is body composition. It's how you look. It's you look at someone and you go, hmm. or you look at yourself, you go, hmm, whatever. Then you have health. Health is what's going on internally, right? Can even be a bit of how, nah, I won't even say it's how you feel, but that's longevity, that's health, that's your ability to like exist in, a, in an optimal way. And then you have performance. Performance is how you feel, and that's your ability to act and to move. So like, can you sprint? Are you not in pain? Are you, um, you know, able to, talking about crunches, you know, it's like, or planks, you know, will planks give me abs? No. Will they increase your performance dramatically? Yeah. Will they make you out, get out of pain? Yeah. If you have lower back pain, generally, you know, this isn't, I don't know you, per, I don't know who's listening to this personally, but as a general rule, like if you have lower back pain, usually your core is super weak. So it's like, yeah. if you build up with planks, super easy. Yeah. Your back, back pain will probably reduce increasing your performance dramatically, getting you out of pain. So it's like, when we think about movements, a lot of exercise that you do isn't for physique, not in a fat loss phase, not really. What it really is for is your performance, so you feel better. And there's a bunch of other things happening, but just to keep it like kind of basic, if you yeah. can only do one thing and you want to lose fat to change your physique, it's nutrition, right? Yeah. And then we talk about the psychology of it. How do you stick to that? Well, you have to sleep. 
you know, you have to get, you have to change your thinking around it. And that's a whole nother thing as well. So cool. Good stuff. Yep. Yeah. All right. Number four. Um, <laughs> number four. Um, cardio, cardio and more cardio is the way to lose weight. So that's not true. Uh, cardio is good. I'm not, I, I don't know that I would ever tell someone not to do no some more cardio. Of, right. <laughs> but I mean, let's, yeah, let's just think yeah. about it. Okay. So let's say that you're on a machine 30 minutes a day and you want to lose weight. So then you say, okay, I'm going to go 45 minutes every day. Right. And you lose, like you may lose a little more weight, maybe depending on how conditioned you are, but it's less weight than you lost before. So then you're like, oh, I'm going to do more cardio. So if if you were to continue that, you'd be doing cardio like four hours a day and your body would become so efficient that you wouldn't lose any weight. Like you may even gain weight. Who knows, right? So cardio is not like the answer. It's a component yes. of losing weight. But building muscle and strength training, the more, in the simplest of terms, the more muscle you have, the higher your resting metabolic rate. So that what that means, in, in case someone doesn't know what that means, is when you're sitting on a couch watching TV, how many calories are you burning? So the higher your resting metabolic rate, the more calories you're burning when you're at rest. So anyway, the more muscle you have, the higher your resting metabolic rate, the higher your RMR, the more fat you burn, even when at rest. So to build muscle, you need strength training. Cardio is definitely good. It does help. It's good. I mean, it's good for your heart. Cardio work, obviously. Yeah. And it does other things. But to think that only doing cardio is going to help you lose weight, you're going to spend a lot of time. It's going to be a lot of wasted time. And you're going to get frustrated. And you're probably going to lose motivation. Great point. <clears throat> I feel like exercise is more indirect benefit than direct benefit for fat loss, right? It's like the indirect benefit of like, a certain amount of it, a certain amount of it to be able to change your state, get you into a good place mentally. It feels good to move your body. It feels good to be able to get your heart going. Like it brings you back to the present, especially in today's day and age, we spend so much time in our heads trying to solve problems and going in circles. So it brings you back to the present. But, you know, to your point as well, it's like you become efficient and also you look at the pros to cons and there is a... Uh, I think it's a bell curve, a bell curve that you can look at when it comes to exercise. So here, I'll go on this side. There we go. It's just mirrored, so yeah. it's backwards. Um, when you do a little bit of exercise, like let's say 30 minutes is the peak, you know, 30 minutes, three times a week. When you go up to 30 minutes, you're at your peak. And probably that's not the peak. Like for this sake of argument, and there's a lot of variables, but let's just say it's 60 minutes. Once you start exercising more than 60 minutes, let's call it 200 minutes a week, your uh, benefit starts reducing. Now, what benefit? That's kind of obscure. For now, we'll keep it very abstract and we'll say it's the benefit of results and keeping it sustainable. Because then you look at like what's happening to your stress level. When you exercise, it is a stressor. So it's like you're either stressing yourself Wow, that's funny. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to do those fireworks right there. Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Woo. it's either you are always in one of two uh, uh, states in your body. You are either in pushing forward, which is a stressor, or you are in rest and you're rested. They call it rest right. and digest, right? Is what we've heard a lot of times. And it's not I'm on or I'm off. It's how much are you on and how much are you off? So when you're exercising, it is a stressor. When you're working, it is a stressor. When you are doing, when you are gardening, hmm. If I mean, you're crawling is, around, maybe. Right, it's maybe, like, yeah. it's like a, you know, it's like if you're really resting and digesting, you know, you probably feel that state change. It's when you're calm. It's when you're kind of at peace for, for that moment. Um, the, the point is just, you know, once you start exercising too much, this can really affect your results and your sustainability. This is why I'm not a huge fan of 75 hard. 
I like the premise of it. I like the idea of it. That's like, hey, you're starting from nothing and you're going to like climb this huge mountain and it's this rocky movie and I'm like changing my whole life. And the best case scenario with that would be that after the 75, everyone completes it. And then you take maybe a fourth of what you were doing and you go, oh, that was, you know, compared to what I was doing, this is so easy. Now I'll just keep this going forever. That's the best case scenario. But what actually happens is I think the success rate, people who finish 75 hard is like 3%. So now you just have more people that feel discouraged and feel like the, the problem is with them because they can't stick to anything and I suck and I'm, this isn't just meant for me. Right. And that, that sucks. Like, that's not what we want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the idea of diminishing results, uh, like we've all experienced it. And, and, and I think many of us have experienced it um, for ourselves and even for our clients, because there is science behind it, but there are also some individual variables that we have to take into consideration. Um, so while we could say you should stop at 16 minutes or, you know, whatever we say, it's not quite that exact, but but you're right. It's um, it's exercising. I'm gonna say smartly or efficiently. Yeah. And that's not to say that someone shouldn't go for like if you really I don't know enjoy biking, go for a two hour bike ride. Like yeah, absolutely, go do, do that. Yeah. yeah. But don't think that you have to do the two hour bike ride seven days a week. Right. right. If you want to do it, go do it. Like that's variety at that point from that perspective is good. But if you're trying to build muscle or strength, you need to stay with the same program for more than four weeks. Like it's six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks. You may make variable, you may change some things within that program, but that's how you're really going to build muscle. And that's not a myth that I plan on talking about today, but I'll just keep talking just very quickly. But you know, a lot of people, me included, how I used to be, I would get bored. Hey, I'm bored. I want to do something else different in the gym. Working in the gym is not like sexy. Okay. It's, it's work. It's hard work. Now, some of us may really enjoy it, but it's still work. It's a stressor on your body. And depending on your goals, if you want to lose weight or you want to build muscle, Following the same program for many weeks in a row is probably what you should be doing. You may not want to do it. It's kind of like the exercise or the machine in the gym. You say, oh, I don't want to do that one. That's probably the one that you need to do. (laughs) If you can explain to me why you don't like it, like, hey, I I always have trouble with my form or it hurts my left arm or something. I'm not very good. I'm not strong at that machine. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's unfortunately, that's when you need to go do it. Like, go do it right now. Well, yeah. when the podcast is over. Go do yeah, that. Yeah, right. Because that is what you need. Yeah. So I digress there. But there you go. Yeah. That was like me when I was, uh, I think I was 15, 16 at the time. I despised hamstring curls. But I get me on the leg extension all day. I was yeah. like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, your yeah. quads are this big, your hamstrings yeah. are like this big. <laughs> now, now they're now they're decently sized, or now they're decently yeah. even, I should say. But um, yeah. yeah, it's so funny. Or like calves, I didn't like training calves. You know, no one does. But now, I mean, hey, now they're I, I I'd flash them on screen, but you know, I don't want this to be you know taken down for explicit. I mean, they're just juicy calves. Let me tell you. Um, <laughs> just kidding. All right, let's go to myth number five. <laughs> myth number five. Um, no pain, no gain. Like, that's, again, malarkey. And yeah. Soreness is different from pain. I, I had a client a long time ago. Um, she would say, oh, that hurts. So I say, stop. She's like, well, why are you telling me to stop? You just verbally said that hurts. She said, well, I don't mean that. Okay. So, and that's when that's when I realized that I, with a lot of clients, I have to be very clear and delineating between soreness and pain. Mm. If something hurts while you are working out, then stop. Like yeah. either you're doing it wrong or you're injured or whatever to stop and let's reevaluate. Right. If it's hard, I'm, I'm going to say push through it, right? right. I'm going to empathize so with sore- you and tell you to do two, two more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of all the things that I really say to my clients that I don't want to say. Uh, <laughs> well, so just 
through it. So soreness is different from pain. Being sore after a workout, while a lot of us like to feel a little bit of soreness, if you feel debilitated, you did something wrong or you pushed too hard. I'm not saying like you did something wrong. Something occurred that is wrong and talk with your trainer about why you feel that way. Um, but while you're working out, know that there's a difference between hard and wow, this hurts. So if it's hurt, you have to stop, like something's wrong. Let's figure it out, whether it's form or maybe too much weight, like mm -hmm. ego involved, mm -hmm. or you're going too fast or intensity, whatever it is, step back. Yeah. Because if you do become injured, then you're not going to be able to work out at least that part of your body. And that's going to pull you further away from your goals or at least stall your forward progress. Some. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point. I, I used to uh, mention to my clients too, or even just, you know, with whoever I'm training with, it's, you know, if you're feeling pain stemming from a joint or close to a joint, maybe it's time to stop. Yeah, like, let's reevaluate. Something probably is off yeah. versus is it just muscle, you know, fatigue? Like you said, that kind of, uh, is it yeah. hard? You know, it's, you don't really want to feel joint. You don't want to feel your joints. Like, if you're like, oh, my knees, it's like, Oh, it's a good push through it. No, <laughs> like that's not a good sign. Like wrist, like any joint, like around, you know, joint, elbow, shoulders, back, knees, ankles, hips. Like it's a signal usually. Pain's a signal. And um, it's not something uh, that needs to necessarily be manually fixed. Like I was talking to a, just a little side note. I was talking to a back surgeon and a neck surgeon recently because he came across my stuff. And um, uh, when I say my stuff, I mean like one of the ads that we had that is like kind of going semi-viral. I think it's got like a million views or something and people are like, you know, this is exactly yeah. what I feel like. And I'm like, yeah. And he said, hey, do you do anything exercise related? Because I have clients and they just don't know where to start. And I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. And we started talking about it and it was things that, uh, you know, I was privy to, but I don't know if a lot of people are it's this idea that a lot of the, um, uh, the back surgeries and the neck surgeries that people are getting are really last resort. And, you know, talking about knee surgeries too, like I remember a, a client specifically that had a, a scheduled knee surgery and they essentially were going to, you know, go in there and do their thing. I don't know what the specifics were. Um, Oh, no, I'm sorry. This was a hip surgery. This was a hip surgery for this client. Uh, back and hip surgery. And I think they were doing a twofer. They were going to like, I don't exactly remember, so I don't want to botch it. Yeah. But long story short, he goes to a physiotherapist ahead of time. And he goes, yeah, dude, your quads are just super freaking tight. Like, they're like piano wire. He goes, when's your surgery scheduled? 12 weeks? Okay. Let's just take 12 weeks and like just start like opening things up and seeing if we can eliminate your pain. And yeah. in six weeks, it was gone. And it's just ridiculous. Like, it's crazy. But we live in an unfortunate society where there's, you know, kind of like, you know, just fix it. Just fix it. Like, what's, what's the fix? Fix it. When really, it's like, the last thing you ever want to do is surgery. And I know I'm going way off course here, but it's like, the last thing you want to do is get opened up and get surgery. If you can at all avoid it. If you're having a heart attack and you need to stand, sure. But it's like, volunt elective surgeries... You want to do a bit, you want to do everything in your power before that, just because somebody like, just because that's the way our system is set up where it's like, oh, you have back pain, you're in your seventies. Well, of course you've been lifting stuff for forever. So of course you need to get your back fused. And it's like, maybe not. There's a lot of things that you can do that we just don't know about. So if there's anyone out there that's like taking elective surgery, DM me and not, not because I want you to like become a coach and pay for my service, but because I can point you in the right direction to potentially save you a ton of pain. Um, yep. because man, I've just, I've just seen like, like not want to say lives ruined, but like quality of life diminishes, like people get the surgery and then it doesn't work because it's like only a 50% chance anything's going to happen. And now they have an infection and you know, it's just crazy stuff. But anyway, sorry, I'm way far off. Let's keep yeah. going. All right, uh, so the two more real quick. One is uh, I'm a firm believer in vitamins and supplements. However, 
the myth is that vitamins are going to give you more energy. They don't, taking a vitamin isn't like, poof, an energy pill. An energy, um, vitamins and, and minerals themselves, they don't have any calories. So they can't provide energy. That's what calorie is. It's energy. It's units of energy. Um, the role of vitamins and minerals are to release the energy from food. So they're a supplement. They are they supplement your diet to help you get energy from food. So that's um, just some people misunderstand that. So vitamins are good, but it's not like you're going to eat one and feel like you go like run a marathon. That's not what it's for. Here's a, here's a little side note on supplements. Should everyone be taking a fat burner? No, um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in supplements. I have my own supplement line, line of supplements, but fat burners are not for everyone. And if, if you are considering one, um, I either contact me and I can tell you why or why not. But if someone is pushing that on you, like as, as like as their, as your coach, you're working with a trainer, uh, and they're saying you must take a fat burner for you to lose fat. Um, talk to other trainers. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a good way to say it. Yeah, you know, it's um, <clears throat> thinking about fat burners. I mean, you probably have more context on this than I do. But like to my knowledge, majority of the time, you're just taking uh, essentially a caffeine pop. It's just a bunch of caffeine. It's going to increase your heart rate, get you to burn more calories at rest. Sure, you can have like some turmeric and maybe some things in there that are like slightly more thermodynamic. So you're going to feel your body like heat up and you're going to burn more cal, you know, but like I've never understood them to be anything valuable in my opinion. Um, do you think they have any value? Caffeine? No, fat burners. Um, they can. Um, they can. There's been research study... For instance, the one I, I carry one. I never thought that I, I never thought that I would ever ever carry a fat burner in my line. That's but my, I do that's have one. The camp I'm in right now. <laughs> I like I never thought I would, but I have one in my supplement line based on scientific research that when someone exercises and they take you know there's criteria, um, but it 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 is effective. And my clients have shown me more than once, I, like repeatedly, not the same client repeatedly, many clients have shown that it is absolutely effective but they are few and far between and and that's a conversation for another day <laughs> yes well, yeah that's yeah very interesting. please be very wary like don't just because a brand is well known that just means that they spend a lot of money on marketing that doesn't mean that True. the efficacy like the effectiveness the efficacy of someone's supplements or, or anything you know uh, that doesn't mean that it's valid it just means they spend a lot of money on marketing so okay. please 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 do your research good point uh myth number seven number seven all right the last one let me pull it up organic food a lot of people think organic food is healthier like from a nutrition standpoint healthier than non-organic food that is not necessarily true so organic foods a food being organic refers to the way it's grown or processed. It does not mean that it has more nutrients in and of itself than non-organic food. I'm not saying, here's my example. If you buy a bag of organic cookies and you look at a bag of non-organic cookies, let's say this uh, organic animal crackers, right? You turn it around, you look at the nutrition. I'm talking about nutrition right now. You look at the calories, the fat, the carbs, whatever. And you compare it with the non-organic animal crackers. You turn it around, you look at the back. They will likely have similar calories and likely the same fat, um, protein, sugar, everything else. One may be a little different than the other just because they're different brands. But to say an all-encompassing organic food is healthier than non-organic food, that is not true. Mm. Yeah. Now, I, eating I, organic, people eat organic for a number of reasons. For the environment, um, the animals, whatever. 
I'm I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I'm only right. speaking specifically of the nutrients themselves. Yeah, to the health. Yeah. I, I watched yeah. a video recently on a this is this YouTube channel. It's called Kurtz Kurtz Kaza. I don't know how to say it, but uh, I don't know. Here, maybe I'll look. I'll look really quick because um, they they have very uh, differing videos on like the universe and food and like very interesting uh, topics, and they're all like short enough, like ten minutes, and then they have like um, like here it is. It's uh, this is their channel. So they have like. 22 million subscribers so they're not a secret <laughs> they're pretty popular yeah but um let me see if i can find the one about organic because obviously we're not going to watch it now but yeah or is organic really better or is it a healthy food or trendy scam now 11 other 11 million other people have seen it too um but if you're interested in checking that out i'll just put the link uh, below because that was a really interesting one that was talking a lot about uh, that. It surprised me because I thought it, it talks about what you think it will, which is like pesticides, um, you know, the, the effects it can have on the body. Yeah. But the conclusion is that, to your point, organic really isn't better. Uh, there are. And it talks about like some of the, uh, found, uh, not foundations, some of the organizations that regulate, uh, if I'm, I might butcher this, some of the organizations that regulate the amount of pesticides on something. And it's like, they're, if it's approved by this, like it has this stamp or whatever, and I had never, uh, I, I, I think maybe I've heard of the organization, but I can't name them off the top of my head. They, um, they regulate like the parts per, you know, I know this isn't parts per million or whatever like, it is. Yeah, yeah. Parts per billion of yeah. pesticides and the amount that would be needed to have any type of effect on your body. And it's below that. So even though something is, you know, it's natural, obviously, because it was, came from the earth, but it's non organic, it's still not any better for your body. Because your body, like, I guess on some level, maybe it is, but it's like so small that it wouldn't make yeah. any difference. And yeah. to somebody that says, yeah, but I want the absolute best. Well, if you want the absolute best, there's probably other things you can leverage. Like, for example, uh, chocolate's a really interesting thing. People that eat chocolate, which is a lot of people. <laughs> um, a lot of chocolates have heavy metals in them. Uh, cad cadmium, I believe, and... Um, there's another one in there and we're not even familiar with it and these heavy metals i mean obviously can lead to heavy heavy metal poisoning so it's like if you eat chocolate often uh let's do some research and figure out uh how much uh maybe we make a podcast on that there was a resource i was watching it was a uh, brian johnson not the liver king another yeah. guy <laughs> And he, uh, he did research on this. Actually, I'll pull up the video. It was like how much, it goes into this video of like how much um, heavy metals are in your chocolates. Heavy metals, chocolates, Brian Johnson. Yeah, so I, I know you won't be able to see this on, on the screen, but it says uh, how toxic is your favorite chocolate? Today? It ranks them from like, and these are all like popular brands. Uh, that you see in the store, and he essentially just ranks them from uh, like great to poor, and he rates them on the amount of flav uh, flavanols they have, uh, flavanols they have, flavanols, flavanols, which are all good things, and then how many heavy metals they have in there. And I believe it's like it's the measurement of heavy metals is like micrograms or something super small. Yeah. But obviously, they make a difference. Um, I'll, I'll drop that below too. It's just all interesting things in case you're like us and you like to learn some interesting things yep. there for you guys. Cool. <laughs> I like it. We talked all about right. a lot of stuff today. We did. Thank you everyone for joining. Please comment below. Yeah, comment below. If you have any questions, I know that it's a Thursday at 11 a.m. A lot of people are working, <laughs> which is great. But um, if this is at all beneficial to you, feel free to like this. Uh, you can comment below, ask a question. Coach Sharon and I will come back and be able to uh, answer them so that we can uh, help you guys in your journey. 
And as always, if you're interested in discovering how we get lasting results for our clients, you can click the link above or below. You'll be sent to a video where I explain it in like five minutes. And then if that all makes sense, you can schedule a call to meet with our uh, enrollment coach team to see if one-on-one coaching could be a good fit, as well as just give you clarity on your goals and help you create your plan. That's it. Enjoy the day, guys. Uh, if you didn't Bye. know as well, really quick, actually, we have a free se- seven-day self-care, uh, our, uh, seven, free seven-day RN self-care comeback challenge starting Monday. You can find the link probably somewhere in the group, and uh, that's going to be great. So join that, too, if you want it. See ya. <laughs> Bye.